Review some of the key points from yesterday. What? Uh -huh. Okay, separation of mixtures by distillation filtration. Any other techniques for separation? Magnet. Anything else? Mm -hmm. We talked about mixtures versus pure substances. Mixtures versus pure substances, yeah. Sometimes to determine that, uh, if something's a mixture or a pure substance, we run it through one of the separation techniques. So um, <coughs> there are other separation techniques. Uh, let's, uh, let me show you once this uh, starts up. But some of the other separation techniques or like, um, like distillation in the tall columns. Do you remember the distillation in the tall columns like this? The lighter molecules will go farther and then the slower molecules. Uh, there's also um, <coughs> separation techniques that, that take advantage of um, how fast uh, things travel, for example, on paper. Um, so for, for example, have you ever put a piece of paper in a cup of water? And what happens is the water starts to climb up the paper. And the reason the water climbs up the paper is because the water is attracted to, to the paper. And so it wants to maximize the contact with, with the paper. But eventually gravity is going to win out. And so it can only climb up so far before it stops. However, um, if you have a mixture of water with other molecules in there, and let's say the other molecules have an even stronger attraction, you know, or weaker attraction. And so the things with, that are more strongly attracted will climb up farther, and the things that are less strongly attracted will, won't. And um, that, that simple technique is called paper chromatography, and a lot of people do this. They don't use water. They use a, another like solvent like alcohol. You know, Alcohol will rise up the paper uh, quite rapidly, and then they can separate things. Now, the th nice thing about alcohol is if you dissolve some molecules in alcohol, then if you mix them with alcohol, then uh, the molecules will climb up here at different rates, depending on how attracted they are to the paper. And if this is long enough, what happens is it will separate. So you can do that with inks. Uh, this is often done with ink. The ink in pen is a mixture of different molecules, and which gives it their unique color. And uh, if you just put a pen from an ink in alcohol and then let it climb up the paper, then you'll see it separate into different colors of ink that they mix together to get that unique color. And then what you do is you just let the alcohol evaporate and take a pair of scissors and you cut out the little spots. Uh, and then you have pure, pure um, samples of ink, each component of the ink that was there in the mixture. Th that technique is called paper chromatography. But, um, but taking that one level uh, of more sophisticated, we, we don't use paper, we use special resins. And these special resins are put into super long columns, like 50 or 60 foot long columns so that you can separate things that are even very close. Like say, if there's a running race, like a marathon, right? Right at the beginning of the marathon, everybody's bunched together. Right? You need that long distance in a marathon to separate out all the runners the fast runners from the slow runners. And so this is why, you know, this paper sometimes is too short. You don't get a good separation. And so in these columns that they have commercially available, they're like 60 feet long. And they put them in a loop like this so you don't have to travel or you don't have to have a six-story building, you know. Um, it's just looped. And so they can travel very long distances and then you can separate it that way. And not only that, you don't have to use alcohol as the transport. You could use gases, you know, if you volatilize it, heat it up. And a lot of these are heated so that things stay, stay gaseous. That's called gas chromatography, which I'd show, but I, I don't know what's wrong with the computer today. Um, so there are other techniques, uh, not just filtration, not just magnets, not just distillation, but there are a plethora of techniques that people use for separation because this is a major challenge in, in, uh, in chemistry is when you're given a mixture, you know, you want to separate it into the components and figure out how much of each component there is. Uh, however, there are some mixtures that are studied 
um, as mixtures. You know, we don't want to separate them into components. We just want to know how that mixture behaves as is. You know. One mixture that's very important is um, that's used a, a lot is isotonic saline. You know, they they mix water and salt at just the right concentration that if it's given intravenously, you know, it matches. You know, because if it's too concentrated, it, it's like um, things will get pickled. Have you ever been in a concentrated salt solution? If you put something in a concentrated salt solution, it, it, it starts to pickle, it gets dehydrated, right? If it's too dilute, you know, uh, the opposite happens. It starts to balloon up. Things will start to balloon up. And so if you're giving yourself intravenous fluid, it has to be at the, just the right mixture. Otherwise, we get pickling or things blowing up. You know, your red blood cells, that kind of stuff. So that's why. So there's um, <coughs> there's uh, mixtures that are studied uh, just on, uh, on, on its sake. But nonetheless, um, <coughs> we want to uh, look at matter and then subdivide it. Uh, obviously, we might have solid, liquid, gas matter. Uh, I think this is not going to work. And so when we look at all matter, you know, this could be solid, liquid, or gaseous matter. Um, we want to first figure out, hey, is that a uh, mixture or is it a pure substance? And so we have all matter, we're going to subdivide it. Um, but how do you know if it's a mixture or pure substance? Well, we try to do this visually. When we try to do this visually, this is what my flow chart's going to differ than your book's flow chart. Maybe I should show the book's flow chart for comparison. Oh, but you know what? I'm jumping ahead um, because we're still trying to review. What, what else did we talk about yesterday? I'm sorry? Purification techniques? Usually purification techniques are uh, involved with the separation, you know, when we separate things, we can separate out the impurities, so, and filtration, so. um, What else? Um, properties, tell me about properties. Well, can you tell me about property? Okay, physical change and chemical change. What's that related to in terms of property? Physical changes are associated with what? Okay, give me some examples of physical properties. Tell me about physical properties. Melting, is good. Boiling. Boiling. Freezing. Freezing, good. Condensation. Those are the big ones there. Tell me some others I've mentioned. Well, um, those ones, boiling, melting, those are processes that are associated with the, the property. The property itself, usually people say, what is the boiling point? And the boiling point refers to what? What exactly is the boiling point? The temperature. The temperature, yeah. Good. Liquid starts to boil. The temperature at which the liquid starts to boil. Melting point's the same thing. It's the temperature. And so that's a property that we can use. Um, use for what? What application could you use that for? Physical properties you can use for what? Observing. Observing, yeah. But what can you use that for in, in relation to? You know, this is where, okay, you, you learn this, this stuff, but you know, you got to put it together. You got to put it together, uh, although I did say something about it, but you should be able to put it together in terms of what's the relationship between physical properties and pure and mixtures? 
Well, distillation, we're going to take advantage of the boiling points and that type of stuff. But tell me, tell me, tell me something about. Um, Come to the the yeah, that, that's good. One thing we could do is we could use the properties to determine is it a mixture or is it a pure substance. I gave you an example of that. What was the example? Water. Right. What What about water? If it's pure, then what? If it's a mixture, then per perhaps what? In other words, what was the what was the take? Well, there's a couple of take home points. With this. Yeah the properties it should be fixed so you know one quick way of determining is that pure water or not pure is, is you can measure its boiling point if it's not a hundred then for sure it's not pure water, pure water. it's got to be a, a mixture and the boiling but but it could you know it depends it, you could have a, a slight amount of impurities if it has a slight amount of impurities it might not um, be all that different it could be very close to a hundred you know, and or you know, uh, in in lab, let me tell you, in lab we boil water, but oftentimes it's not boiling at 100 because our thermometers, our thermometers are not calibrated, you know, and so our thermometers are off a little bit, right? But you know, that's a that's a connection. You gotta, you know, okay, pure versus mixture. Well, that's a challenge in chemistry. I said, well, one of the things is, how do you know it's pure? How do you know it's a mixture? Would you drink that water? You know. If I gave you something that looked like water, would you drink it? No. What would you want to do? You'd want to make sure it's, it's reasonably pure. It doesn't have to be pure. It could just be tap water or something like that. But, but you know, one of the ways that you can determine, hey, maybe that's not water. Maybe that's some other thing that looks like water, but it isn't. And so what um, people do would be a quick test of... Yeah, because we know that pure substances, I don't want to repeat myself, but you know, these are the things that you got to do after, you know, afterwards, you got to try to make as many, well, it, it takes time, you know, it takes time because you got to let the material gel. But what you got to do is you got to interconnect the, the things, you know, so, and then you got to, you know, think about, okay, mixtures versus substances. And, Stuff. But anyway, um, we, we were talking about properties, so let's just stick with physical properties. Uh, another physical property, can somebody give me one, just one more physical property? Uh huh. Density. Density is a, a great one. So, for example, another thing you could do with the water is you could measure its density. Water should have a fixed density. Do you know what the density of water should be around? The, the w density of water, a lot of people have that one memorized. It's around one gram per milliliter. In fact, it's it's right about right there, right at one gram per milliliter. If you dissolve a lot, you know, like for example, uh, if you dissolve a lot of sugar in the water, what's going to happen? It's going to weigh a lot. It's going to weigh a lot more, and it should. Uh, it's not going to be pure water, is it? No, no. It's going to be sugar water, right? And it should uh, should have a density greater than one gram per milliliter. But even if it has a density close to one gram per milliliter, like Diet Coke, um, it's still not pure. You know, so you, you know, if you take very precise measurements, you'd see that Diet Coke has a very close density, but actually the density is a little less because of the uh, CO2 that's dissolved in there. A lot of CO2 gas that leads to buoyancy. Did we talk about anything else? Do, do you guys, you know, these, these are the things, all these things, you know, if you have them in your notes, and when you flip through your notes, you could just quickly review it. You know. But if you don't have them, then it's easy to forget, you know, kind of stuff for sure. But, uh, you know, pure substances should have a fixed set of properties. So we know that pure water has a fixed set of properties. Density, melting point, boiling point, you know, the freezing point and uh, condensation point are the, uh, the same temperatures and then uh, color etc cetera, etc cetera. You know, those are the things that we can um, consider 
Whereas mixtures, you know, their, their properties would be off. So if there are impurities in there, you know, uh, one of the quickest ways to tell if a solid is pure or impure, one of the quickest ways to tell the purity of a solid is by? I'm sorry? Well, um, anybody else? What is one, if you had a solid, an unknown solid, well, you, actually, let's say you had a solid, you want to check its purity. You know, one of the quickest ways to check its purity? Melting point. If there are a lot of, you know, remember the, uh, the two types of solids, uh, depending on how things are organized, what were those two types of solid? Crystalline and amorphous, right? Okay, if you have a crystalline solid, what does that mean? Everything's like perfectly arranged, right? If there are impurities in a crystalline solid, do you know what happens? If you have impurities in that crystalline solid, it screws up that arrangement. And so what that does is it screws up the melting point. So for example, if there are a lot of impurities, what happens is normally when a solid melts, it's boom, it melts at 100. But if there are a lot of impurities in there, or zero, or whatever the melting point is, if there are a lot of impurities there, it starts to melt at one temperature and it won't finish melting at a, until a much higher temperature. The more impurities there are, the wider that range. And so there's a transition. And the reason is, is because uh, some of this crystal lattice, we call it crystal lattice, is weakened by the impurities, so it's easier to break apart. Well, it's easier to break apart. We don't need as much, what do we call, what do we call that motion? Well, motion's kin kinetic and then energy. Kinetic en we don't need as much kinetic energy to break it apart, you know? And so it starts to melt early. But the stuff that's still pristine is going to be strongly held together, so we need more kinetic energy to break it apart. And so you look at that melting point. If that melting point starts spreading out like that, it's not good. It's, it's an indication that the solid gets screwed up from here, you know? So these are all these, you know, the properties. The properties are so important because the properties are what we use to identify. I mean, how do you know what you have? How you know what you have is you have to measure it like this. I, if I gave you a piece of wood and I said, okay, what kind of wood is that? You know, uh, you go to, uh, you know, there are people who've been doing this for, for many years, but, you know, if you're a novice, I, I don't know, is it oak or is it pine? You know, but, but you might say, okay, pine is very uh, low density, oak is much higher density, That's, that may be one way of d doing it. But we, we'd start to look at some of the properties, like density, whatever else, we use properties to help us identify. Most of the properties that people use are color, you know, color and, 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 and state, but we gotta be, be a bit more detailed because we deal with a lot of like white solids. We deal with a lot of white solids, we need to know a little more about the the properties that define that white solid. And so the connection, there's a huge connection between properties, mixtures, and, su and uh, substances, like pure substances, because you know this is what we use all the time in, in trying to understand things. Is there a question here? Oh yeah, is boiling point and combustion points like No, 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 they're not. Um, <coughs> For liquids, we have something called the flash point. The flash point is, the, you know, you don't need a flame to ignite certain liquids. In fact, you don't need a flame to ignite most liquids. All you need is heat. And so the flash point is the temperature at which it will start to combust. Uh, it'll catch on fire. And so um, a hot server. Some, some um, things have a fa flash point less than uh, room temperature. So immediately when they come, in, contact with air, boom, they catch on fire. Those materials are called pyrophoric, you know? And so, um, so uh, the, you know, that's way below its boiling point. And so there's, there's competing things because, you know, uh, combustion and that type of stuff, that's not a physical property, that's a um, chemical property. And so, for example, if we wanted to boil something that's pyrophoric, we cannot boil it in air. We have to boil it in the absence of air. Uh, how can you boil something in the absence of air? In, in, in how you boil things in the absence of air is uh, you have something called a vacuum pump. The vacuum pump and then you have some um, really uh, strong uh, containers and, and tubes and glassware and that kind of stuff. 
And so what you do is you suck the air out of the container. You suck the air, but is it possible to suck all the air out? It's not possible because uh, we don't have uh, vacuum pumps powerful enough for that to suck all the air out. And then air starts to leak in various spots. And so usually you suck the air out and then you don't want any air in there. So you backfill it with something like helium or argon. Helium and argon, those are special. Those are in the last column of the periodic table. In the last column of the periodic table, we call those the Nobel gases. So helium, neon, argon, those are very stable. Um, very, very stable. And unreactive, you know, they're not easily perturbed by anything. And so you backfill it with uh, like argon, helium, and then you suck it out again, backfill it again, suck it out again, and that way you know you get rid of most of the air in there. And then um, you fill it with helium or argon, and then you put your stuff in there to boil off. And then you can boil it because there's no oxygen to combust it. And so you can boil it without it catching on fire. The same thing with sugar. You know, if we did that with sugar, let's say you put the sugar in a pot and you suck all the air out, and then you backfill with argon, that sugar is not going to caramelize. That sugar is not going to burn. That sugar is just going to melt. So you get molten sugar there. Um, and so, you know, that's a competing process. The competing process is, uh, is that physical property. We, we're never going to measure that physical property because the D, there's something called a D, decomposition temperature. And the decomposition temperature for sugar is well below its melting point in normal conditions. But you, we can go to abnormal conditions and melt it if we want. You know? And so um, the other thing is chemical properties, right? If somebody gave you a, a liquid to drink and you test it for flammability and it catches on fire, then it's best not to drink it, even though it might look like water. Right? There are a lot of things that look like water. But, or the smell. You know, you smell that, and it could be an instant indication. Hey, that's not water. You know, that's something else. And so, is but smell is what we call a physical property. You know, flammability would be a chemical property. And so, we use properties to identify: is it pure or, or, or is it mixture? And so, well, one of the first properties we look at is the appearance. Is it homogeneous? Or is it heterogeneous? Heterogeneous we have to be careful with. Uh, sometimes things can look heterogeneous just because um, you got different sides. Like diamonds. Have you seen like raw uncut diamonds versus cut diamonds? Oh, actually. Let's see, the computer came out. I'm going to switch back to the computer. Some things, sometimes things might look heterogeneous, but in fact are um, pure. You know, like these diamonds here. Um, diamonds are made, do you know what diamonds are made out of? Carbon. Just carbon, uh, pure carbon. And so it, it, sometimes it gives the appearance of, uh, uh, and so, uh, and colors too, you know, because colors often depend on um, what? Did, do you remember what I said about colors? It depends on the purity for sure, but it also depends on the, the light, you know. But if we're just looking at with it with visible light, um, do you remember what I said about color? And what example I gave? Hmm? Yeah, the blue, but another one, another example of color in the example I gave. Salt, right. What did I say about salt? Yeah, salt is actually, what color is salt? It looks white, right? But it's actually, yeah, well, clear, clear, things can be clear and still have a color, 
like this. Clear just means you could see through it. Um, it's not opaque. And so this, I can see through it, so I'd say this is clear. There's no junk in there, you know, solid junk or whatever else. So chemists will call this clear. And so we, we never use clear for colorless. This would be a clear blue solution. Okay, we use clear to indicate that you know, there's nothing floating in there or you can see through it. Whereas like milk, there's lots of stuff floating in milk, you can't see through it. You know, that's not clear. And so, um, uh, yeah, salt is, is, is cool. So it also depends on crystal. If you have different size crystals, they can give different colors depending on how big or how small they are. Uh, that happens with copper. You know, a lot of people will, will see very, very tiny crystals of copper. Do you know what color they are? The, actually, very tiny crystals of any metal always go to black. They go black. That means that, you know what black, you know what white means? White means, because we, we, when we look, think about light, light has all the colors of rainbow. And so if an object is black, like this table, that means it's, it's absorbing all the colors of the rainbow. And so things like copper, which is, which is normally red-brown, go, go black. Because the crystals get so small, they end up absorbing all the colors of the light. That happens with um, pretty much all metals. So, uh, but, you know, sometimes we can get fooled uh, into thinking it's heterogeneous, therefore it's a mixture. But, um, but that's what we're going to say. If it's heterogeneous, for sure, it's got to be a mixture because usually they're multi-phases. Now, what is a phase? That's another key word from yesterday. These are all things that should, you know, if you review it right away, you know, what you want is you want fast recall. If you have fast recall, th let me tell you, the did I tell you the exams at UCLA yes. aren't meant to be finished? It's, you have too little time, too much exam. So how do you, if you want to do good on an exam, what do you do? You have to have speed. You have to be able to recall this stuff fast. How do you recall this stuff fast? You don't sit there and think, what? What was that? You know, you, it's got to be right there. In order for that information to be right there, you got to keep reviewing it. So it's like, it's like, um, you know, uh, it's like a practice move, you know, it's, um, where it's automatic. You don't even have to think about it, you know. It's, it, so you're learning some kind of a new move or something like that, or uh, you want, you know, initially it's going to be uh, awkward or, or cumbersome, but after practice it'll be, you know, this happens in sports, you know, people want to get it programmed into motor control, right? And so it just happens automatically. You know, you throw the ball, it happens automatically, quickly, without thinking. You know, otherwise, if you're sitting there thinking, how do I throw the ball again? You know, what do I do? You, you know, there are people who are going to be on it. Like I told you, there are people who are on it and know it. Everything that was said yesterday, they're on it. You know? Those people are going to be, you know, you look at them and you look at your exam, you look at their exam, they're almost uh, ten, five times farther. Uh, you know, or whatever. They're, 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 uh, so, so UCLA, I don't, uh, personally, I don't like speed, um, speed tests, but that's all I ever had, or, um, timed exams, you know, pencils down, pencils up kind of thing, you know. My exams are not, you know, my exams, I give you plenty of time to finish, and because I want you to go back and double check all your answers, you know, make sure you didn't make any simple mistake, which, ha which often happens, especially with time. Exam. So um, there's going to be a huge advantage if you can recall stuff quickly. And how do you recall stuff quickly? Well, this is how I trained myself. It, uh, in fact, it wasn't just um, once a week that I reviewed my notes. For some classes, I reviewed my notes every day. It didn't take very long, you know, um, to review your notes. It barely takes any time. And, and if your notes are complete, then it's instant recall. You might think, well, you know, that's not real learning, you know, this, but that's the way it is there. You know. I know a lot of people who think that uh, I don't want to memorize, you know. I want to be able to think things through and then do it. But, but if you memorize a lot of information, then you can think a lot more things through. You know, if you know a lot more than another person, then you can figure out a lot of new stuff, a lot more new stuff than 
or solve a lot more problems than another person can because you just have a lot more tools available to, to do. But anyway, uh, let's get back to uh, this here. So there, there are a few other things we talked about. But this is the type of stuff. Yeah. And so uh, if it's heterogeneous, it's a mixture. But we have um, a problem when it's homogeneous. If it's homogeneous, it might be pure. It might be pure, or it might be a a mixture. And so uh, we have to do additional tests. What additional tests we typically do? We try to measure its properties. We try to separate it, you know, using a chromat chromatography or something like that. Uh, this is a challenge here. Um, for example, uh, for sure, like my yeast uh, sugar mixture was was um, was a mixture. You know, there's yeast floating around and all kinds of junk in there. It definitely was not clear. Um, but the, um, I forgot to mention, do, do you know what wood, you know, wood, you know what wood is made out of? Do you know, wood is made out of cellulose? You know paper? Paper is made out of cellulose. Paper is made from wood, right? And what is cellulose made out of? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Do you know what the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is in, in cellulose? Two to one. You know, OS, OS gives you a little indication. Sucrose, cellulose, glucose. One way of understanding what, um, what cellulose is, is it's glucose linked together. You know, like wood is cellular glucose linked together like this, boom. There's one glucose, another glucose, they link together, link together, link together. And so wood is sugar. And so it makes sense. If wood is sugar, then hey, what did I use for my alcohol? I use sugar. And so isn't wood a much cheaper form of sugar? You get some pine or some oak, just use that. Or paper, you know, lots of go to the paper recycling center and just grab a whole bunch of paper and use that. But the problem with um, the problem with that is uh, this. Can you eat wood? No. The reason you can't eat wood is because how the glucose molecules are linked together in three dimensions. This is why the three dimensional structure is so important. Glucose molecules are linked like this, let's say. Whereas you know, uh, you know glycogen? Yeah. Glycogen is also glucose molecules, but they're linked together like this. You know? And just because they're linked together differently, we can eat sugar, glycogen, we can metabolize that, but we cannot metabolize wood. Termites can. Termites love wood. It, it must be very sweet for termites because it's just all sugar, all carbohydrates. And so, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem totally odd that somebody would try to wood, thinking that wood is made up of glucose, to try fermentation and unknowingly end up, you know, killing a whole bunch of people or blinding them. And so, um, that was something I forgot to mention yesterday. Because what were we talking about that? Uh, what were we talking about? Uh, alcohol. Alcohol is like... Were the two alcohols we talked about yesterday? Ethanol, ethanol and methanol. methanol. What's the difference between ethanol and methanol? One carbon. One carbon right? Ethanol has. Mm, ethanol actually, has, well, not one, but two. two carbons. Ethanol has two carbons. And methanol has one, one carbon. Do you remember methane? How many carbons did methane have? One. And there's a link there. You know, the, these are the, these types of links you notice after. You know, the, the tenth time you go through that, you go, wait, wait a minute. 
methane, methanol, they both have one carbon. You know, and that's something that you don't see initially, but you know, after the 10th time you've gone through the notes or the 20th time you've gone through the notes, you go, it starts getting boring. And then you start looking for things. You start looking for connections or whatever else, right? And then you start to notice some links like methane, meth, meth. That meth part, you know, methane, methanol, that, you know what meth means? Or meth? One, one carbon. And so I, I, maybe I said this very quick, but the methanol in your body's um, metabolized methanoic acid, which is formic acid that attacks your optical nerve irreversibly. But we're going to learn these prefixes. Um, in fact, pretty soon we have to learn, you know, these. Meth, eth, prop, but. So, for example, propane. Take a guess. How many carbons does propane have? Three, Three carbons. Butane? four carbons. Pentane? Five. Five. Et cetera. We, we're going to have to learn these prefixes because we're going to have, have to deal with some alcohols and some other hydrocarbons like methane, ethane, propane, butane, those types of things. And so meth, eth, pro, but, pent. Do you know what the next one is? Hex. Anybody know what the next one is? Hep. Hep. Hep is for seven and then off is for eight, and then nine is known, and then ten is deck. And so those are pre prefixes that um, pretty soon you have to memorize, so you might as well start earlier. But um, making, uh, like, like I said, making those connections is, comes from um, memorizing the material. When you memorize the material, then you can make lots of new connections. So there's, there's a really a, a great advantage in memorizing material, you know, because it's not just memorization, but it's trying to apply things um, to uh, other systems as well. All right, so it could be pure or it could be a mixture. If it's pure, then we only have two choices. What are the two choices that we have? If something's pure, it's a substance, it's a pure substance, then we have two choices. What are the two choices? This is from yesterday. Right? Yeah. It could be an element. Or it could be a compound. So pure gold would be an example of an element. Does anybody know the symbol for gold? No, AU. AU. Well, it comes from Latin. Something like that. I think it's orium or something like that. I don't know exactly. And so this is why it's a weird symbol. But it could be pure gold. That's what you'd like rather than something like 18 karat gold or... What is pure gold? 24 karat gold. 24 karat gold. 18 karat gold is an example of a mixture and it depends on who made the mixture, right? You know, they probably the people who make that mixture are very precise about it, but maybe, you know, maybe they add a little less gold, a little bit more. Silver, uh huh. What is much jewelry? Because wouldn't 24 carats be really um, easy to damage? Because it's so soft. soft. Yeah, yeah, probably. Most, ju most jewelry is, I think, 18 carat, isn't it? It's alloy, it's a mixture. But I, I, I don't know. I do know that. Um, yeah, gold is, uh, well, any. I, I'm not that sure. I do know, um, well, actually I took jewelry class in high school, so I made some jewelry stuff. And uh, we used silver, but the silver, you know, the silver, what happens with silver is it tarnishes. Usually gold keeps its luster quite nicely. I mean, so that's, um, that's a chemical property, you know. Silver tarnishes, and that tarnished silver versus gold. Now, how do you get rid of silver tarnish? There are different ways you could get rid of silver tarnish. What some people do is they scrub it off, you know. Let's say they have some um, silver platters or they have some silver tableware that's gotten this black tarnish. They can scrub it off. But if you scrub off that silver tarnish, what are you losing? You're losing some silver. And so if you lose silver, well, that's not good. And so um, 
there are other methods where you can chemically reverse the tarnishing process. That way you don't lose any silver. You keep all the silver. And then I also made uh, jewelry out of copper. Copper was way worse because copper is much more reactive. You know, copper didn't last very long at all. But, you know, copper and silver are a lot cheaper. So it's easy. And silver is easy to solder also. So I, I never touched any gold, though. But it was one of those electives. It, um, the, uh, it wasn't that I was um, totally in, in. It was a fun class, but it was uh, uh huh. Is sterling silver just silver? Or no, Sil sterling silver is a mix as well, isn't it? Actually, uh, I don't know what the composition is. All right, uh, sterling silver is an alloy. An alloy is what a solid solution. Do you remember what the solution is? I talked about solution, but I didn't really give you that many examples. But what is a solution? Homogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixture, good. So we can have solids that are homogeneous. Sterling silver looks pure. It, it, it totally looks pure. That's what a solid solution. Solid solutions are also called alloys. Alloys are solid solution or homogeneous mixtures of these metals. You can't really tell unless you get a very powerful microscope. If you have a powerful microscope, then you can see the crystals of the metals, like crystals of silver, crystals of copper in the mix. Or sometimes it's incorporated in the structures, you can't really see it. But anyway, sterling silver is an alloy or, or mixture that contains 92.5% silver and 7.5% copper. But you know, Making this mixture is not so easy. Are you going to hit it right on the button, 92.5% each time? No, sometimes, you know, if it's 92.5%, you know, some people might want to go, well, I'm going to make that 92.45%. If they make it 92.45%, then it rounds up to 92.5%. They do that because then they can save silver, make more money, right? Versus somebody who, who goes, okay, I'm going to make my sterling silver 92.54%. If they, that's great because it contains more silver, but they're going to lose money in that. Also, if there's a profit motive there, you got to watch out with mixtures. Uh, you know, it's like this. The example I gave with pure sugar water. I don't know if the point came across. The point was that if you go buy pure sugar water, it depends on who makes it you know, um, what you're going to get in that mixture. You're not going to get the same thing each time, you know? And so there's really no such thing as pure sugar water. Uh, the, the, you're not, you might not get the same thing with this alloy. It depends on what batch it is. And uh, of course, somebody's going to test it, you know? If they test it and they say, hey, you didn't put enough silver in this, then, you know, if they're reputable, they're, you know? But, but if they're at 92.46%, well, that rounds to 92.5 and then they're fine, you know. So um, fine silver, for example, has 99.9% pure silver or is relatively soft. So silver is usually alloyed with copper to increase its hardness and strength. Sterling silver is prone to tarnishing. And, uh, tarnishing is just a chemical process. Um, if we look and maybe we'll show some. Silver tarnish. Huh. Um, Norman silver pennies. But it doesn't look like silver, does it? It's quite tarnished. You wouldn't want to get a piece of sandpaper and sand that off, I'm sure. 
probably just leave it in its natural state. But if you had a silver platter and it looked like that, that's pretty bad. So you'll probably want to do something. So they, you know, they have silver polishing compounds, but avoid that. What we do is um, we use a chemical technique to reverse it, to reverse the tarnishing. And that's it. Because what we want to do is we want to go from this. Silver tarnish is what we call a compound, right? It's a com silver tarnish is a compound between silver and sulfur, let's say. But you know, uh huh. Oh well, I was just gonna say, how much of the silver is taken off when you do when you polish it? How much? Not much. Not much. Not much. Because so. the yeah the the tarnish here, um, the, the the weight of that is it's combined with the compound, and then once it tarnishes, it's not like rust. You know, if you're to take off rust, it depends on how badly rusted. The, the tarnish doesn't really. It forms a kind of a barrier to further, further corrosion. So it's not much at all. And so this is why lots of people polish the silver. It's still no big deal. I mean, I'm talking about minute, a minute quantity. Yeah. And then if you really want to save it, then that's it. It's the same thing as like a penny. It's the exact same thing like a penny. You know. Um, so for example, if you take your copper penny and it's it's heavily um, oxidized, we don't call it tarnish because tarnish is a little bit different. But it looks like tarnish, and uh, it's it's oxidized. If you take your penny and um, you could try this at home, you, there there are different ways you can remove that that coating on it, the corrosion, the oxide. One way is you can just sand it off. That's what we do here. We we you're going to use copper. We're going to use copper things like this. And you sand it off. Oh, you're going to lose a little bit of copper. Another way you could do that is you could um, you could use a chemical to eat it away. The chemical would be like, um, this is what I used to do, um, young. Have you ever put like a, like a Del Taco or Taco Bell taco sauce on pennies? Have you ever done that? If you want a clean, <laughs> shiny penny, get some taco sauce and put it on there. Because the taco sauce has vinegar in it. Or you just take some vinegar. <laughs> But the taco sauce, but taco sauce, because if you if you got nothing else to do and you're sitting there, you might as well get the pennies out and clean them, you know, with the taco sauce, because then you're gonna have some nice shiny pennies. But that's gonna eat away the coating, and then you gotta wash them off afterwards. But um, the, but then again, you're still losing it. And so what we want to do is we want to reverse the process. We want to go from compound back to element. And so, you know, going from compound back to element, it's not so easy. Can we filter out the tarnish? I mean, is there a way that we can filter out and leave the silver behind? I don't want to lose any silver. And so I just want to get rid of that other stuff. Can we just filter it out? Can we distill it out? Can we chromatography it out? No, there's no physical means that will do it. And so what we have to do is we have to do chemical. And so there's a way to do this. The way to do this, to get the silver back, is just to reverse this process chemically. If we reverse this process, we aren't going to lose any of the silver. All the silver is going to go back to its element. And so we can break down compounds into its elements by chemical means, but physical means will not work. So chemical um, separation techniques. So chemical separation techniques take advantage of its chemical properties. So for example, if I have water, Water consists of hydrogen and oxygen. If I want to separate the hydrogen from the oxygen, I'm going to use a chemical separation technique. I can't filter out the oxygen from water. I can't filter out the hydrogen from water. You know, the, wa wa the hydrogen and water are linked together in that molecule. And so it, it's going to require chemical separation to, to do that. Whereas mixtures, when we have a mixture, you know, um, it could be a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture. We can separate the mixture into its component compounds or elements using um, physical means. So, for example, if I had gold um, mixed with oil, that's easy. Gold mixed with oil, just wash off the oil. You know? That kind of stuff. Um, gold, the, the 
the interesting thing about gold is if they made these Norman um, pennies out of gold instead, you know what it would look like now? Yeah. It would look like it was brand new. You know, it would look fresh. That's that's um, because gold is like the um, what was that last column of the periodic table called? The noble gases. Gold is like the noble gases. It's very stable. It's very unreactive. Which means gold gets a designation as a Nobel metal. Gold is a Nobel metal. Like a Nobel gas, it's very unreactive. Platinum is also a Nobel metal. So platinum, uh-huh. Gold still Depends on how, how it's polished. Yeah. Because my mom's friend, she has like a gold bracelet that oh. she can't take off. And she polishes it and it looks like weird now. Yeah. yeah. Right. Gold, like, <clears throat> as mentioned, gold is a very soft metal. Um, this is why, uh, you know, gold foil is surprisingly cheap. You can get like pure gold foil, but it's so little gold that it looks like a lot of gold, you know, because it can be hammered into very, very thin sheet. Gold's very malleable, but being very malleable means it can, it's susceptible to damage like that. It's, uh, it's easy to scratch, it's easy to do whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, about the still thing about the Del Pablo stuff and the coins, uh -huh. I saw that Coca-Cola things in it as well. That's the kind of thing I heard. Do you know why? Yeah, Coca-Cola has phosphoric acid in it. Uh, Coca-Cola uh, is, 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 is acidic, um, and in fact, um, the, because of the carbon dioxide, when you have carbon dioxide in water, like sparkling water, sparkling water is going to have a lower pH, it's going to be more acidic than um, other water. And so some people are drinking the, the higher pH water, like pH 7. You aren't going to get a pH 7 water with sparkling, because of the CO2 that's dissolved in there, and it makes it acidic. You know, our bodies are like this. The blood, our blood acidity, our pH, this is, you know, um, like the acid, acetic acid, vinegar, you know, there's acetic acid. These acids uh, change the pH of things and so So as we exhale, you know, it helps to raise the pH. You know, people who are like hyperventilate or do that, their blood pH gets messed up. And so, yeah. The Coca-Cola is acidic. You could do it, you, like your teeth will fill it too, or potentially the acid. Yeah, uh, just a little bit of phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid is used for a lot of purposes, like um, removing scale, removing rust, this kind of stuff. Some of it. We're going to learn more about chem chemical properties as we go along. Okay, um, so this is the, the breakdown here. Uh, the Post the PowerPoints here. So I'd look at it a little differently you know, when I look at matter.
elements versus compounds. Uh, we could just uh, identify some of these here. Um, this wire, that would be, that would be uh, copper. It's probably pure copper there. What does that look like? Gold, maybe silver. They're usually iron. These are tricky because some of these are, are heterogeneous in a way. These are zinc coated, so there's a zinc coating on here. This this looks like, or maybe this is stainless steel. Do you know stainless steel element or compound or mixture? Um, it, it's not a stainless steel is not a compound because uh, how do I know it's not a compound? How I know it's not a compound is because there are different formulations of stainless steel. You might not know this, but there's 304 stainless steel, 430 stainless steel, a whole bunch of different ones. There's surgical grade stainless steel versus like kitchen grade stainless steel. And so there's a whole bunch of different things. So if stainless steel has a variable uh, composition, we don't call it a compound, we call it a mixture. mixture. Stainless steel is going to be a homogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixture. This is pure though. You know what this is? This black stuff? Silicon. The, the pencil uh, lead is not lead. The pencil lead is graphite. Graphite is pure carbon. It's pure carbon. These copper pennies, we only have real copper on the outside. You know what's on the inside of the copper penny? Zinc. But it's pure copper on the outside. The CD, well, the, the, the plastic could be pure there. Um, these are some examples of compounds here. Uh, actually, that's probably gold. Yeah, that's probably gold. So compounds, chalk is a compound that has more of a fixed composition. Baking soda, quartz. Roll a um, drain cleaner, water. I think it's water. The compounds. All those look pure. All right. I, I want you to start. I, I actually, not only the. Uh, I said maybe start with the first three um, rows, you know, of the periodic table, like hydrogen, helium. But you should go on to the fourth row, you know, and plus some extras. In the lab supplement, you're going to need to know the first four rows. Can everybody see this? The first four rows, and so all the way from hydrogen to krypton here. But you, you'll need to know some additional ones. Not everything, um, but you'll need to know things like AG. You know what AG is? Silver. Silver. CD. Cadmium. PT. Platinum. AU. HG. PB. SN. Tin. AS. So um, there are others, xenon, radon, um, and some down here, which we need to know down here. We need to know U, uranium. Other than U, you know, not much. Like see, SM is kind of popular right now. SM because of Sumerian magnets, the super powerful magnet. U for sure. Um, so in here, this, like these are, are kind of important. IR, IR is um, really important for geologists. You know why? why? You know where most of the iridium on Earth comes from? Or the same? Came from? Yeah, a, a meteorite that smashed into the Earth and spread a thin layer of iridium across the entire globe. You heard of that? And the thing about meteorite apparently wiped out the dinosaurs. The iridium layer. Uh, so iridium. Another interesting thing about these two is what do you think the most dense element in the period? I'll tell you what the least dense. What do you think the least dense element in the 
comparing to is helium. What do you think the most dense is? Do you think maybe lead or gold? Gold? Those are pretty dense, but it's not. It turns out the osmium iridium, these are the most dense elements. And so we need to start learning the symbols. You know? Most of the um, elements are just the single symbol, like sodium, Na. But some elements um, don't like to, to be alone. Some elements like to pair up, like hydrogen. Hydrogen likes to pair up to form H2. Do you know any other elements that like to pair up? There are seven all together. So hydrogen's one. Yeah. Yeah. Sulfur um, likes to form eight, eight ring, eight-membered rings like a crown. Mm -hmm. Chlorine. Okay, so the way it goes is hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are the seven that like to pair up. Maybe I should write those down. But these ones you should know as the seven diatomics: hydrogen. Nitrogen, oxygen, uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Is that seven? Yeah, that's seven. Yeah. And so if somebody's saying, uh, if somebody's talking about oxygen, you know, um, the element, then they're talking about O2. Oxygen, the element is, I mean, oxygen, the element that we breathe. What we're breathing in right now is O2, mm -hmm. you know, pure oxygen. Um, you don't want to breathe much O3. Do you know what O3 is? Yeah, that's a good, good, uh, I would think trioxide sounds good. Tri for three, oxide for oxygen. But it's not trioxide, it's ozone. It's ozone. Um, and so there are other forms. For example, we have O3 and we have O. O is called atomic oxygen, and it forms in like pollution processes, and it burns. Atomic oxygen is not happy, and so it starts attacking things like your eyes and your skin, and it'll start to irritate them. Ozone's not that happy either, because ozone likes to break up into O2 and O, atomic oxygen, which is unhappy. Atomic oxygen likes it wants to pair with something, so it's going to start trying to pair up uh, with things. So this is ozone. And so sometimes we see this. These are called allotropes of oxygen. Allotropes. So sometimes when people are talking about oxygen, it's a little bit confusing. Are you talking about O, O3, or O2? You know. And so sometimes we have to be a little bit more clear. But most of the time when people are talking about oxygen, they're saying O2. However, when I talk about carbohydrates, you know, so for example, wood. Wood is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Is the oxygen in wood O2, O3, or O? Is the oxygen in wood O2, O3, or O? kind of, these are a ways of writing out the structure. And this is, in organic chemistry, we like to do this. There's supposed to be a carbon here that they don't show. Um, they show all the non-carbons. And, and, and oftentimes, they won't even show the hydrogens for shorthand. You know, they want to write these structures out quickly, because if you're drawing out all the atoms on paper, it takes a long time. And so they come up with these line diagrams like this. But this molecule here is glucose. And so we have a glucose linked with a glucose linked with a glucose by what's linking atoms, linking them together? Oxygen. 
And so when people are talking about the oxygen and glucose, they're talking about just O's. They're not talking, there's no O2 in oxygen. Like, for example, let's say you're underwater and there's a piece of wood. Can you suck the oxygen out of the wood and breathe that? Is that possible? No, because the oxygen, the oxygen's linked together in here. This oxygen's linked to two carbons. This oxygen here is linked to hydrogen and a carbon here. These links are called bonds, chemical bonds. This whole thing's bonded together to form a discrete unit. Cellulose, this is what we call a polymeric unit. This thing just keeps going and going and going. It's very long mole molecule. And it, it doesn't have a distinct uh, beginning or, uh, I mean, it doesn't have a distinct end. It could be longer or shorter, depending on how long you want to make it. You just keep adding more. It's called a polymer, polymeric compound. But when people are talking about the oxygen in cellulose, they're talking about O, not O2, not O3. When people are talking about oxygen, you know, you've got to breathe oxygen to survive, they're talking about O2. When they're talking about pollution, and well, they, they won't be talking about oxygen, they'll be talking about ozone. You know? O3. have some, um, and this is what we're going to do very soon, is we're going to learn how to name some of these things, like HCl. HCl is called hydrogen chloride, or another name for this is called hydrochloric acid. We'll learn it. HCl is a very common uh, compound that we use in lab. Listen, if this is in molecular form, we call it um, hydrogen chloride. If we take this molecule and dissolve it in water, it's called hydrochloric acid. H2O, H2O is called water. Or um, if we wanted to use the, uh, we have a naming system in chemistry. It's called nomenclature. Nomenclature is just a naming system. If we follow the nomenclature rules, um, which we don't always do, you know, there are some things we use a common name, like ammonia. Ammonia is a common name. I, I was looking for ammonia in a catalog once and I couldn't find it. And I, I was thinking, why don't they have any ammonia? And then I, I finally found it. They didn't call it ammonia. They called it nitrogen trihydride. And I thought, why nitrogen trihydride? Yeah, it makes sense. I know what nitrogen trihydride is, but why do they use the nomenclature system? Why didn't they just call it by its common name? Everybody knows ammonia. Right? But um, water, by its nomenclature system, is called dihydrogen monoxide. Dihydrogen monoxide. And since it's called dihydrogen monoxide, some um, pranksters got an idea that they're going to petition their city council to ban dihydrogen monoxide because dihydrogen monoxide is toxic, potentially toxic, right? You can drown. And so the uh, city council passed a resolution banning dihydrogen monoxide they, because they had a whole list of chemicals that they were going to ban from city use. Dihydrogen monoxide was one of them. It was a very funny story. I don't know all the details. It's on Wikipedia, but uh, something like that. It's crazy. But it, uh, here, this is uh, called barium chloride, not barium dichloride. And so what, you know, why do we use di sometimes? Why do we use tri sometimes and not other times? So we have to think about that, you know, and the, we have to look for the patterns in that. And once we see the patterns of that, then we can figure it out quite easily. We talked about atoms and molecules already, so I'm going to skip this slide. This is the law of constant composition or the law of multiple proportion. And um, law of constant compositions, any compound is always made up of elements in the same proportion by mass. That's a lot. Of, well, water always has the same amount of oxygen and the same amount of hydrogen. Always. It never varies. Well, pure water is going to be H2O, um, but that's not by mass. By mass, it's different. H2O is two atoms of hydrogen. Are hydrogen atoms very heavy? No. One atom of oxygen. So H2O is 67% hydrogen, 33% oxygen. Right? Two-thirds hydrogen, one-third oxygen. But not by mass. If we do it by mass, H2O is 11% hydrogen, 
or 12%, 11 to 12% hydrogen, 88% oxygen. This oxygen weighs a lot more. But that never changes. It's always going to be the same because if it's pure water, it's going to be that. We, don't, we aren't going to see any variations in that. Um, mass proportions, we'll talk about. Weight ratios is fixed. Composition of mixtures. Composition of mixtures aren't fixed. Mixtures like sterling silver, they don't have to have a fixed composition. And so this is why sterling silver is not a compound. If sterling silver were a compound, it would always have the exact same amount of silver each time, right? No matter who made it. We are most interested in electric. Elect we have to learn a little bit of electricity and physics. Uh, so electrical character of matter. We have positive and negative and neutral. You know? Positive and negative attract. And so we say like charges repel, unlike charges attract. So positive, negative attract, negative, negative repel, positive, positive repel. And so the rule is like charges repel, unlike charges attract. Or I just like to say unlike charges attract because we don't really look at the repulsions that much. We just look at the attractions. And so in other words, unlike charges attract, uh, you could just. Um, yeah. Here's a demo. This is chemistry in action. You know, what causes that stickiness? I mean, look at these two balls that are stuck to one another. What causes that stickiness? The electrical attraction. They must be oppositely charged, something like that. And so do you see these two balls? And they did it. They charged it. Um, then they, uh, they reverse. They charge one ball positive, the other ball negative. And then they reverse it. Now both balls are charged positive. And what's happening? They're staying away from each other. And then they charge it negative, one ball negative. It's just they're generating static electricity. So here they're using silk cloth on glass. Here they're using fur. To, to change the charges here. And so that's, that's water molecules. Water molecules get stuck to each other. They, they're sticky, right? That stickiness is a, a result of electrostatic attraction. We're also going to be looking at chemical equations like this. I'm almost done here. This is the um, burning of, of charcoal. Charcoal is carbon. In oxygen, we form CO2. We could form carbon monoxide, but as long as we get the ratios correct, it should be okay. We have reactants and products. Reactants are what you're mixing together to get the react, and the products are what you form. So here, this water. Water, we want to separate out into the elements. What are the elements? The elements are hydrogen and oxygen. Can you do this by physical means? No, but we can do this by chemical means, you know, the separation of water. Sometimes we look at energy, too. This is a butane. Butane has how many carbon? Four. Four. So this is butane. We can burn butane in oxygen. Um, people, you can buy this at the supermarket. In fact. It should make CO2, water, and a flame, energy. Kinetic energy. Flames have a very high kinetic energy. It causes them to convert into plasma about um, just energy or heat. Right. Uh, we give a name for that type of reaction in terms of energy. It's exothermic. And so if something generates energy, it's exothermic. If something consumes energy, it's endothermic. So for example, if you want to melt ice, melting ice is exothermic or endothermic? It's endothermic because what you have to do is you have to heat up the ice in order to melt it. That is, you have to input energy to melt the ice. Freezing water is exothermic or endothermic? It's exothermic. You have to, it's going to generate heat. You have to take away that heat. How do you take away the heat to freeze up or take away the kinetic energy to freeze up water? 
you take away the kinetic energy by putting it into a freezer. The freezer is going to take away the kinetic energy and, and cool things down. So we have endothermic, another example of endothermic reaction would be photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, plants take CO2 and water and energy, and then they make uh, glucose and oxygen here. Glucose would be like cellulose, you know, you link the glucoses together, C6H12O6, or they, they store that, I think, or whatever they do with it. And so this would be an example of an endothermic reaction. Um, and then we have potential energy. Um, potential energy is, we have two types of energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, but um, we have two objects, two objects. One is a can of air, another is a can of hydrogen gas. Both, you know, this is, um, this is, have you seen those hydrogen cars driving around now? There's a couple of hydrogen filling stations. There's a hydrogen filling station on 190th. Have you seen that? There, near Western, and another one, I think, on Prairie. Hydrogen gas filling station. So you could put hydrogen gas. But I thought, I, you know, there's no way I would drive with a tank of hydrogen <laughs> under my seat. Because have you seen, did you see the Hindenburg? Yeah. <laughs> you know, do you want to die in a horrific fire? slash explosion? No, so um, I, I talked to a guy who drove a hydrogen car and I asked him, you know, why do you, uh, gasoline, okay, but, you know, you got a little bit of time to escape, but with gases, you know, that's compressed gas. Compressed gas is, if you knock the top off the compressed gas, it, it would, it would, it doesn't suck the air out of the room, it pushes the air out of the room and this whole room would fill up in a second with hydrogen gas. You know, it's, comp it's under like 2,000 psi pressure, something like that. So I asked the guy, you know, don't you feel uncomfortable driving that? He says, no, no, no. You know, b before I got it, he could only lease it because they don't um, actually sell them. He, he got one of the Mercedes ones, and um, he's, he's telling me, no, no, he feels totally comfortable. He said, before he bought the car, they did this dramatic demo of the tank. And so he said that they took the tank up to 60,000 feet and dropped it out in, into the desert and nothing happened, nothing broke, you know, from the valve or anything. So it was a horrendous impact. It was very dramatic. They could have done this in the lab. But to, to show the, the um, and so he said he feels totally safe. He's not worried about any leaks of hydrogen because they have these safety valves, that type of stuff. And the tank is very, um, very strong. But anyway, if you have a tank of hydrogen at room temperature, room temperature we call around 25 degrees C, and a tank of air at room temperature, 25 degrees C, you know what? Both of those have the same kinetic energy. But, you know, what would you feel more comfortable? You know, let's say your friend asks you, I want to store a tank in the garage. I have two tanks. You can take the air tank or you can take the hydrogen tank. Which tank would you feel more comfortable taking? The air tank. Why not the hydrogen tank? You go, hey, your friend says, hey, they have the same kinetic energy. They're both at room temperature. The hydrogen's not hot, you know, you could touch it. They both have the same kinetic energy. You'd say, no, 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 no. I'd, I'd rather take the air tank than the hydrogen. It's trying to, to ask you to take both of them. I had a friend <laughs> this is funny. I had a friend who asked me to store. He, he bought some surplus um, science equipment from NASA. He, so he asked me to store this um, high vacuum. I asked, oh, I said, okay, in, in the garage. And I asked him, what is it? And then he said, oh, yeah, I got one thing here, and it has a brilliant window. Have you ever heard of brilliant? Then I said, ah, let me, I haven't having second thoughts, because brilliant is very toxic. And so I declined. Which is okay because you know, I, I know the toxicity of brilliant. But anyway, um, but he might have argued, hey, you know, it's at room temperature, it's not hot, you know, it's not a high energy thing. But you know what? 
even though hydrogen is not hot, it is a high energy thing. Why is it a high energy thing? Because not because of its kinetic energy, it's because of its potential. potential. It could potentially explode. If it explodes, then you know it's going to be on the news, disaster, house leveled, or that will probably level an entire block of houses. You know, a big cylinder of hydrogen gas like that. And so, anyway, um, that's potential energy. So when we think about matter, we think in both in terms of kinetic energy, how hot is it, versus potential energy. Hey, can it explode? Is it going to be reactive? You know, this kind of stuff. So even though these might be at the same temperature, the oxygen, the ozone, and the atomic oxygen, these have totally different potential energies. These are very energetic, ozone and oxygen, whereas O2 is a lot less. So, but still energetic. That's potential energy. It turns out that energy, like matter, you know, we have these things. The fr um, the uh, like atoms, atoms can neither be created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. In nuclear reactions, it's a different story, but in chemistry, the atoms don't disappear, right? We talked about that. It's conservation of mass. Energy, it turns out, is the same thing. Energy can be neither created nor destroyed. Um, energy is conserved. And so this is, I mean, this is backwards a little bit. So we have the law of conservation of mass, we already talked about that. There's the same thing in energy. You know, the total amount of energy before and the total amount of energy after are the same. But it's the um, potential and the kinetic energy combined. The potential and the kinetic energy combined is what we call the total energy. And so the total energy before is the same as the total energy after. You know, potential energy might be different, but then the kinetic energy would be um, the same, or you know, vice versa. It's a, it's a, it's a balance. And so, what we have is a combined one. The combined one is the law of conservation of mass and energy. It turns out that Einstein, um, in especially in nuclear reactions, the it turns out that uh, some of the mass is um, converted to energy. And so, the Einstein thing, uh, I don't really want to talk about right now. I don't want to talk about this until we get to nuclear chem. Are we doing nuclear chem? I think we're doing nuclear chem this semester, so I don't want to talk about this until we get to nuclear chem. So for right now, you should focus on the law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy is called the first law of thermodynamics. Um, then we, we're going to have some end of the chapter stuff that we'll look at. But what we'll do right now is let's take a break and then um, we'll come back and we're going to do the lab uh, today. I think we're going to check in. We'll check in and then, well actually we'll do the lab and then we'll check in or we'll check in and we'll do the lab. Maybe we'll check in first and then we'll figure it out. Okay.